So welcome to a webinar primer on succulents and I started getting into succulents last year and just kind of fell down a big rabbit hole and found out just more about them than I had realized was out there and went from just having a few jade plants that I had gotten from my mother's jade plant to way too many. <laughs> so it is kind of rabbit hole. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the best ways to care for succulents. You know, some people do struggle with them, or maybe you're just interested in wanting to get started, or you had some problems. And then we're going to talk about how to propagate some species and some uh, genuses of different succulents. And there's a lot more out there than we're going to cover today, but I'm kind of going over the ones that are more popular might be a little bit easier to find. Um, if you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. And when we get to the end of the session, we'll also go um, oh, and be able to open mics up for questions then as well. So what are succulents? Succulents are really amazing plants in that they have these fleshy stems and leaves that allow them to survive without water longer. This does not mean that they don't need water ever. They still need water, but what it means is when it hits a period of drought or the soil dries out, they're going to be okay for a lot longer than, let's say, a peace lily or a Chinese evergreen that starts to get very droopy very quickly when there's not adequate moisture in the soil. So it's a survival technique. Um, and if you're wondering, the, the plant in this picture is a Hawarthia. So this is a type of succulent. Hawarthias are actually kind of somewhat diverse species. So there's a lot of different varieties of appearances in these guys. So we also want to kind of clarify hardy versus um, soft succulents or tender succulents. So hardy succulents are ones like the Semper Vivums that hens and chicks, house leeks, some of our sedums such as, you know, your autumn joy sedum that, you know, you see flowering in the, in the summer. These ones are hardy down usually around zone four or five, some even down to zone two. So they can tolerate freeze. Um, they're not recommended for indoor growth. These guys are best just being grown outdoors in the, in the, in the conditions that they require for best um, success. So actually, I was actually talking to some people at a program I did the other week, and apparently this winter was really hard on some of their Semper Vivums, and they were struggling to see them come back. So when you have extreme situations, sometimes these, even the hardy succulents can struggle, and we had a really long, cold winter. So on the opposite end of things, you have tender succulents. Most of the tender succulents are zones 9, 10, and up. Um, and they can be grown indoors with adequate lighting. There's a huge wide variety of um, shapes and colors and sizes. And so you might also hear them referenced as soft succulents, but they usually can tolerate um, so zones nine usually is uh, the average lows for the that like during the, the winter months would be 20 to 30. So they can tolerate a period of light frost, you know, six hours or less, but extended frost or extended freeze would kill these plants off. So these are ones that, you know, we're going to take and make uh, indoor plants for us and then, you know, outdoors during the summer. So that's just kind of a, a difference. The picture on the right-hand side is actually a variety of a jade plant. It's just kind of got wavy leaves, so it looks a lot different than what we're usually used to seeing. So if you are interested in something like the Semper Vivums and wanting to know a little bit more about them, um, Martha Smith, another horticulture educator, did a presentation on them as part of our Four Seasons Gardening series. And so there's the link there is go.illinois.edu backslash Super Semper Vivums, and you can listen to the recording, and she talks a little bit more in detail about those. So if you are interested, there's a resource of information that you can go to. So this is just a short, longish list of different types of tender succulent species. Um, Aeonium, you're probably very familiar with aloe plants, cotyledon, uh, the crashsela and jades, uh, echeverias, grape dopetalum, huarthia. Then there's hybrids of some of these tender succulent species that are, you know, uh, hybrid crosses. Uh, Kalankawi, pacophyte, and portulacaria, senecio. Then there's also tender sedums. So we have our hardy sedums, and then we also have tender sedums. And there are a lot more, they're a little bit more 
more obscure, um, but these are some of the ones that are usually a little bit easier to find if you start hunting around. Um, the picture on the right, this is uh, out of the group of the Senecios. This is a string of pearls. It's actually become a pretty popular plant if you're on Instagram at all. Um, the trend of people posting pictures of house plants and succulents is really exploded, and this is one of the ones that's very, very popular right now as well. So, when it comes to lighting, uh, you know, the two big things for most plants for survival is are they in the right lighting spot and, are, and water. Water are usually are two defining factors for how well our plants do, and sometimes those are the ones where we struggle a little bit more, especially if we're just getting started. So, a lot of these tender succulents, you can place them outdoors for summer, you know, those color, they'll get, you know, sometimes some lighting, it's going to be a little bit brighter, um, but you want to gradually transition. It's the same thing as if you're moving a normal house plant to the outside or you're transitioning seedlings you've started indoors and you're transitioning them to the outside growing conditions. So if you do a sun transition from indoor lighting situations into really bright light, you can get scorched succulent leaves. And that's what you're seeing in this picture. This is a jade plant that went from indoor lighting situations to outdoors, and those leaves got scorched. So that kind of darkish color, it almost looks a little bit purple, is actually sun scorched and sun scald on those leaves. So we want to slowly transition them outside. With that being said, succulents are better off if they're getting either morning or evening sun because even if you have taken the time to transition them outside, what we end up seeing is that afternoon sun, which is a lot more intense, um, can actually damage these plants. And so you really want to avoid um, any kind of afternoon sun. So if you can get that filtered sunlight, things like that, you know, about six hours of bright sunlight a day and they'll be okay. Just avoid the really hot heat of the afternoon sun. So it's great because you want to, you know, get them outside. They're going to be even a little bit more prolific. Your, your succulents are going to love you for it. Now on the indoor lighting things because these are plants of course that cannot survive our winters so we are going to want to bring them inside um, for the winter or maybe we are purchasing during the winter and so we need to provide supplemental lighting so they need about six hours as I kind of said of bright indirect you know bright indirect sunlight to keep colors and prevent the stretching so the picture on the left are succulents that I personally ordered and purchased in December uh, and they arrived on December 14th of last year and so you can see they're nice, they're compact, you can see the colors, the, the echeveria in the bottom right um, is actually got a bloom on it. Well, you can see that the very top of the picture, this is Pearl von Nuremberg. Um, she's a type of echeveria species, really great color. You can see how compact she is. And the picture on the right, I took on June 1st. So you can see that stretching and it's not uncommon for succulents to stretch without, if they're not receiving adequate lighting. So that's where, we go into the propagation to kind of rejuvenate what's going on. So this is what happens if you're not getting enough sunlight, they're not in a right window. So if you've got a great, you know, southern exposure winter uh, window for, you know, the winter months, that's a great place, as much light as possible. But what if, but if you're in a situation where maybe that's not the case, or you've got buildings or things that are blocking any sunlight from coming in, what we can do is supplemental, uh, it, su well, we can supplement our lighting. But to also give an example in inadequate lighting is not only can it cause stretching, it can cause color changes. So. The picture on the left um, is a Senecio, another variety, and you can see the big difference from String of Pearls. And you see that kind of blue chalky color. Well, the picture on the right is from months later, and you look at how much it's stretched and it's completely lost its color. So that's another thing that adequate lighting is critical for in providing the right color and so the plants are going to look really well. So what you can do is provide supplemental lighting and so you'll read various things and you'll hear things about gr grow lights and this and that and so the actual the actual lights are labeled as grow lights can be kind of pricey. They can be a little bit more expensive. So really, you can get away with a one cool white and one warm white light bulb and a, and a fluorescent light bulb, and you'll provide supplementary irrigation, putting it on a timer. Um, 
recommendation is to replace those light bulbs on a, a yearly basis, even if they haven't burned out, because the newer the bulbs, if you replace them every year, the quality of light is going to be increased and it's going to be more beneficial for your succulents. So for every one hour of sunlight that they would normally need if it was real outdoor sunlight, you want to provide about two hours of supplemental. So if they need six hours of bright indirect light, you're going to provide 12 hours of supplemental lighting. So this is when if you have a timer, you know, you, put, you plug the timer in the wall, you plug your lights into it, and you just set it and let it run. That way you're not having to remember to turn them on and then turn them off um, during the day. So it makes life a little bit easier. But that supplemental indoor lighting is going to be really beneficial for your plants, and it's going to help minimize that stretching, and it's also going to help minimize um, that color change that you saw on that previous slide. So when it comes to potting mix, you know, this is another critical thing too, is succulents don't like wet feet. They don't want to be drowning. So we don't want a potting mix that's going to hold a lot of moisture. So you're not going to get a potting mix that has those moisture holding crystals. What you want to look for are cactus mixes and get those cactus mixes so they're very fast draining. Um, I've tried a couple of different ones. The one that's in this picture is actually a little bit heavier on the sand side of things. Um, and no, you're not going to grow succulents in straight sand. That's actually not going to help either. That's, that's not going to provide them the nutrients that they're going to need. You do need some of that bit of that water holding capacity, some of that organic matter that's going to provide them what they need. So you can just buy a commercial uh, pre-made cactus mixes. The one I had before this was a miracle Grow cactus mix and there was a little bit more organic matter. It was a little bit lighter of a soil so I'm kind of seeing how they are working. Now some people that really are getting into it, what they will do is they'll actually take a commercial mix and they'll add some other stuff in to make it a little bit more well drained, uh, less likely to hold that moisture. So the examples are there, just some of the ones that some people will do, you know, they'll take one part of the potting mix and then they'll mix in some more peat moss or coconut core is another option as we're looking at, you know, environment, people are starting to switch away from peat moss, going more to the coconut core. Um, and the coconut core is actually really great because um, it's easier to get moisture to get absorbed into it. Peat moss is one of those ones that it's really hard to absorb moisture. So you want, you know, sometimes you got to get it wet first before it'll start doing anything. But coconut core, easy to get, um, a great substitute for peat moss. Um, play sand or coarse sand, those perlite, that perlite is that white puffy stuff um, that you see in those mixes, which assists with drainage. So make sure that you're, you know, using the right uh, potting mix um, for your succulents. Don't use anything that's got, you know, garden soil label on it. Um, but if you get a regular bag of potting mix that's not labeled for cactus mix, you can kind of up that drainage by trying to follow one of these potting mix examples. Of course, containers. Um, you know, if you go on Instagram or you go on Flickr and you start searching for succulents, you see people growing succulents in all sorts of different types of containers. Uh, the picture on the right is one from Flickr, and they're just, you know, old teacups and bowls. But the big problem with these, you know, that kind of situation is usually very temporary. You're not going to have long-term survival of your succulents in containers like that because we've already talked about how much succulents need a lot of drainage. And so you really want to use containers that have a drainage hole. And so terracotta pots are great, especially for beginners, because they dry out so fast. There's nothing to prevent that moisture from kind of getting whipped out and away. Um, and so, you know, terracotta pots are a great choice, but you can really use anything. Now, if you happen to find a container that you really like, um, but doesn't have drainage holes, what you can do is you can set it up as a cash pot. So it's basically an exterior coating for a pot with a drainage hole. Um, and so what you do is you take put the plant in the actual pot that's got the drainage hole, you'll take it out of the outer pot, water it, let the water drain through, and then you can put it back in. That way you can get some more interesting pots if they don't have drainage holes without worrying about whether or not that water is going to cause some rot issues and succulents. So, you know, especially if you're just getting started or maybe you've had problems with succulents in the past, you know, look at some of your containers you're using. That might help. Um, some people have recommended putting rocks or pebbles on the top of the soil surface because what it does is it actually prevents your succulent leaves from 
from coming into contact with moist soil. So if you've had rot issues, you know, that can somewhat alleviate a little bit of that. Plus, it looks kind of cool. And watering. Watering is probably one of the number one problems most people have when it comes to succulents. Um, they're overwatered. And so we the best way to do it, and one of the reasons I do like uh, pots that have holes in the bottom, especially if they're big enough so you can actually touch the bottom of the soil, the best thing you can do for your succulents is let them dry out completely, and that's what you want to do. Kind of water them and forget them. They're great for people. If you forget to water plants, succulents are probably going to do really well for you. And so what happens is when they get overwatered, um, you'll have yellowing leaves. Leaves might fall off. Um, they'll start getting rot, so they'll turn brown or black and start getting mushy. Um, the leaves might actually be overly engorged because they've taken up too much water. But the picture on the bottom right is an example um, of a succulent that looks like it's appeared to be overwatered. Um, you can see that yellowing towards the base of the leaves, um, along with you know probably some lighting issues. Now succulents can also be underwatered. Um, in cases of underwater, those leaves will actually start to shrink and they'll start to shrivel. And there won't be any of that brown or black mushy component that you get with uh, overwatered succulents, but they'll just look very shriveled and wrinkly. So you know it's definitely time to water. You want to actually water thoroughly. You want to make sure that water goes out the bottom of the pot and any of the water that's in a tray, you're going to get rid of. And part of the reason we do this too is it actually helps to flush excess salts out of the soil that won't build up because we don't want that build up. Salts that build up can actually cause some root burn. So um, in this picture, I have a watering can that I really love. It's got, it makes it real easy to water. And the spray bottle is actually for purposes of propagation. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So fertilizer. Um, the nice thing about succulents is they're not high demand in regards to fertilization. We're not going to be fertilizing that need to fertilize them, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, some places uh, recommend, you know, fertilizing just at the very beginning of the growing season when in the spring when days are starting to get longer and growth starting to resume or at least a couple times during the growing season. You definitely don't need to fertilize and don't want to fertilize in the fall and winter months when growth is starting to slow down. So um, you want to use a fertilizer that's low in nitrogen. The one that's in here, um, it, the nitrogen is only 2%. So it's very low nitrogen. Um, and you know, you think about the fact that the last succulents are green, you'd think they gain more, but they for, they don't. Um, now, if you are using a fertilizer that's not specifically listed for cacti and succulents, most of your liquid cacti succulent foods you're gonna find is gonna have a very low nitrogen uh, number on it. So if you use something that's more of a kind of a general purpose, like a 555 or a 101010, 10, 10, um, go at a half to a quarter rate. Um, of what it would recommend. So if it's, you know, if it's a tablespoon per gallon of water, you're only going to use a half or a quarter of a tablespoon because otherwise you run the risk of when that nitrogen component is too high, actually can burn and, and damage your succulents. So you want to keep that nitrogen level on the lower end. Now, succulents aren't immune to pest problems. Usually the number one pest problem that succulents get are mealybugs. They can also get things like aphids and spider mites, um, things like that. But mealybugs are usually the number one. And in this picture, this is a jade plant that sadly got um, infected with mealybugs. You can see kind of what looks like white fluff. And those are the mealybugs. Um, you know, and so one of the things is it's more likely to show up on succulents that are in containers, especially if you take them outside. So you want to be sure to monitor. And they can, it can happen even if they're just inside, you know, things get tracked in. So, you know, when you're watering it, taking the time to inspect your plants, you know, is anything abnormal? Is anything out of place? Also, if you're bringing a new plant home, uh, make sure to inspect that plant to make sure there isn't any there are no bugs on it, that there's nothing that you could bring in because if one plant gets mealybugs, it's not hard for mealybugs to jump to another plant. So always make sure to inspect any new plants before you bring them in. And there's a couple of options for management if you do run into pest problems. Um, if it's a small infestation of different types of bugs, you know, trying to do a moderate spray of water to try to just knock them off. Um, if it's a small infestation. And with any of these insect problems, you want to get them at the start. You don't want to wait till they get bad. Um, there are systemic insecticides available for houseplants that you can get and you, you, you know, 
apply it to the soil um, and then that plant will take that insecticide up and so as those insects are feeding on that bug on that plant um, they are able you know they'll get a mouthful of chemical and it'll help control that population insecticidal soap are another option for soft-bodied insects. Um, you can actually use uh, rubbing alcohol. We do recommend testing it on a leaf first to make sure it's not going to cause any damage. Um, but what you can do is either take a uh, cotton ball, dip it in rubbing alcohol, and wipe it over the bodies of those insects, or you can use a spray bottle with rubbing alcohol and just making sure you're getting into all the little nooks and crevices so you're not missing any of the insects or the little young ones or things like that. So there are some pretty easy ways of dealing with pest issues. And so with all my succulents knock on wood, um, I've been lucky so far in that I haven't had any problems. Um, and so... It can happen. Um, just make sure to get ahead of the game if it does. If you start seeing signs, you know, try to address it as fast and as immediately as possible. So that's just kind of a quick basic. Really, succulents are very easy to care for plants. It's when we overlove them through overwatering is usually when we run into problems. And then of course we get that stretching. And I will tell you right now, I've had a lot of my succulents are very stretched out. And so it's a good thing I like creating new plants. Um, and I've been having a little bit too much fun with it. But propagating succulents is great because it's very easy. Now, depending on what type of succulent it is and we'll kind of guide a little bit in regards to what the method is and basically you end up having um, leaf cuttings and stem cuttings are two major ways of propagating succulents so um, leaf cuttings if you take leaf so in this picture is um, echeverias um, and I've just put them in what are normally saucers for your your you know your pots I put some cactus mix in there and I've just laid them on top of it this is actually a pearl von Nuremberg um, and you can see the little what looked like little legs at the bottom of that one leaf and those are new forming roots um, so the leaf cuttings are going to take a heck of a lot longer to form new plants for you than a stem cutting is going to because there's more there to start with. Um, you want to allow those leaves or those cuttings to callus for a few days um, before, you know, starting to get them wet or putting them in dirt, things like that, because what you want to do is you want that callus to form over where you've made the cut or disconnected them from the, the parent plant to prevent any rot from setting in because there's a lot of, you know, that's it's a succulent. It's very good. It's going to rot very easily if there's too much moisture. Um, leaf cuttings like this, you're just going to lay them on top of the soil. Um, stem cuttings, after callusing, you're going to put them into an appropriate potting mix, a cactus mix or a potting mix that you've kind of beefed up a little bit. Um, what I like to do with my cuttings, um, especially those leaf cuttings, I like, my, I like to have a spray bottle and I'll just spritz them on a daily basis. Um, there are times where I've been able to walk away. You know, I've been out of town for the weekend and I haven't sprayed them at all and they've been fine. Um, I do recommend, you know, if you're going to do any kind of cuttings or rootings, make sure that that's an indoor project and not outdoors because it's going to dry out too fast with this heat. Um, so, again, as with normal succulents, especially when you get in those stem cuttings, you want to avoid overwatering. Go ahead and let them dry out. Um, that's okay. They're going to be okay and they'll survive. Um, but overwatering, you'll rot your cuttings very quickly and you'll have to start over. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of succulents that um, can't be propagated via stem or leaf cuttings and those are uh, a little bit different um, but we're going to go through a couple of varieties now a couple of different genuses and species and kind of talk about um, propagation and also I've got some timeline information in here so you'll get an idea of how long this might take um, as well so aloe um, I gotta thank my mom for this uh, the picture on the left hand side she loves putting collages together um, and so this was last year in June um, as you can see in the bottom of the picture on the left she really does a great job of growing aloes and next to is actually a huge jade plant um, and so aloes are one of the ones that you propagate via division you can't take stem uh, you can't take leaf cuttings um, off of these and have them survive so what we do and what we did last year is we took the entire thing out of the pot um, and we divided off babies into separate containers and then some of the bigger 
parts of it. What we do is we strip off the bottom leaves till we have basically just a, a part of that stalk, and then we repot that and we start the cycle back over again. And so aloes are just ones that are a little bit different, um, but they can be very easy to grow. Again, a lot of times I see um, aloes struggling just usually due to overwatering in some situations. But yeah, these are very easy ones to propagate and to grow, um, but it's going to take a little bit longer because you got to wait for the mama plant to set off uh, side shoots for you. So this is echeveria. these are echeverias, and these are some of my favorites. There's a huge range and diversity of echeverias. Um, you can see in the right-hand picture, this is an echeveria called Painted Lady, and what's great is she um, forms a lot of offshoots and little side shoots as well. Um, Rambulet is the one on the left, and you can see it actually was producing flowers when, it, when I got it back in December. Um, and what I did discover is, also with echeverias, um, how fast they stretch is really based on the cultivar. So Rambulet is a little bit stretched um, for me right now, but it took a long time for it to get there where the other ones really stretched out very, very quickly. But just in this picture, in the middle, you can see the diversity. Now the two plants um, that are kind of in the middle, they're both green. That's a jade and a kalonkawi, but you can see the other fives around them. They're all from this kind of rosette, but you can see there's a lot of diversity in regards to the color. And also, um, as you get further into echeverias, you know, the, the leaf shape, the color, and things like that, all very, very, uh, but they're all great, gorgeous plants. So with echeverias, um, the nice thing is there's a couple of different ways to propagate them. And you can see in this picture just how stretched out they got but they all started the same compact size but you can see they've all stretched at different rates and they've all been in the same window so that kind of gives you an idea and so um, you can do leaves um, and you can remove the top now when you do remove leaves and this goes for any of our succulents what you're going to do is you're going to take a leaf and you're going to just gently wiggle it because you want to get an entire leaf to detach from the plant. You don't want to leave anything behind um, because then you don't have a, a good break and it doesn't have as good of a chance of actually rooting out for you. And also keep in mind that every leaf you take off may not root out for you, um, but you can still get quite a few. So this is just uh, one way. And usually what happens... No. Eventually, um, what happens is those uh, leaves will start forming a new plant. They'll form roots. They'll form a new plant. And eventually, that leaf will eventually wither away once it's gone. So this is, you know, one way of doing an echeveria. You're literally just going in and you're removing that top rosette part that isn't fully stretched. Um, and then you're just going to, you know, let it callus for a day or two. And then you're going to go ahead and put it into um, some of your cactus mix or the mixes that you've made yourself. And so here's just a couple of things. The picture on the right, you can see at the top of the that base of the leaf, you can see the new little plantlets forming, but you can see that leaf itself is withering. And that's what we expect, and that's okay. Um, in the picture in the middle, you can see all the little roots that are starting to form. Um, and the picture on the left just shows, you know, where I'm a, I've actually detached one of the leaves from the stem. Um, and what some people have had success with, and I haven't gotten that far and I'm going to try it, is what they've done is they've removed um, the top of the echeveria and there's no more leaves on it and basically is just a little stalk and they've actually had it start to regrow some side rosettes on it so that's one of my next pro uh, projects once I get everything going so you can see the little plantlets are starting to form and so also depending on species is going to depend on how fast. So this is an example of a timeline. This is Pearl von Nuremberg. Um, and I originally removed um, the leaves from her on April 25th. The wonders of technology and it being able to date stamp your photos. Um, by May 2nd, I had placed them on top of dirt. June 1st is... Um, you know, we're starting to see some of that root growth. And then by June 11th, we actually started having some plant lifts that were starting to form at the base of one of the leaves. But you can see how long that took. And also, you know, April, we're, you know, we're starting to get into slightly longer days. And of course, your best time to propagate any of your succulents is, you know, spring, early summer as growth is very active. And that's when you're going to have your best success and luck with it. 
Um, this is graptocetum. It's actually a cross between a graptopetalum and a sedum, or a tender sedum, I should say, and graptopetalum we'll cover a little bit later. Um, but April 25th, um, one of the leaves had already detached at one point, and you could see how it very quickly formed a, a new uh, plantlet. But you can also see how much these guys stretched between when I got them in, it was like, I want to say December or January, and the left. And you could see how stretched out they became by beginning of June. So this is part of the reason we do propagation. So grape to see them, again, um, same thing, you can do cuttings. Um, or you can do leaf uh, cuttings as well. Either one are options, and leaves are pretty easy um, to do on things like this. So this is one uh, another uh, succulent. Um, and if you can keep it condensed and dense, uh, it looks very nice and is a lot nicer when it's not stretched out. This is Hawarthia. This is one you saw at the very beginning slide. Um, and you can see on the right, this is a different, spe uh, different species um, of Hawarthia. And so there's a lot of differences. Um, some are more uh, just kind of in, in more of in a row, some are wider, just there's a lot of variations. And so with Hawarthia, there's actually two ways to do it. Um, they'll create offsets or basically baby shoots off to the side, and you can detach those from the plant, or you can also do um, leaf cuttings like you would. The Hawarthias are a little bit stiffer than the Echeveria, so you have to be a little bit more careful, and I found that with those leaves, you want to make sure maybe to get towards the base of the plant where it's going to be easier to break, to kind of get that leaf off. Um, also, I, I should note, when you're watering, avoid overhead watering, because as, as I'm looking at this, avoid overhead watering. Make sure that water hits the soil, because the other problem sometimes is if we get too much moisture on top of our succulents, that water will sit there and hold in crevices, and that can also lead to rot issues. So make sure to only water the soil itself. Now, when it comes to jade plants, jade plants are, are in the, the uh, genus Crassula, and there's some other Crassulas in there as well, and so they kind of got clumped together. And so the picture on the left just shows a wide variety of different types of jade plants. The uh, picture on the right is another Crassula, but it's actually called String of Buttons. Um, there's a couple of different varieties, different colorations you can find out there. Um, and it's basically a segmented uh, type plant compared to what you what you might see with a jade plant. So um, this picture on the right should look fairly familiar. It's the same one that was on earlier. Um, and so when I was actually taking pictures of different things, um, I kind of was pulling this guy out. And the picture in that very top, you can see little white roots. And uh, he had slightly become detached from the plant. So as he had kind of be detached, that callus formed, and he was forming roots. And when I moved him, he fell off. So now I've got another one propagating. With jades, you could do stem or leaf cuttings. Um, with some of the smaller ones, you know, sometimes it's easier to just do your, you know, your leaf cuttings. You're wiggling that leaf off. Um, and so the, the picture on the bottom left, that middle jade, is what a lot of people are familiar with when they think of jades, those real kind of thick uh, leaves, kind of the bigger plants, and there's different, a bunch of different varieties um, that have really kind of changed up how jade plants appear. And so with those jades, they're actually, those are actually cuttings off of my mother's jade plant, um, and I brought them home. I actually let them sit out for probably at least two weeks before I got around to them and then put them directly in the pot and since then they've rooted. So with jades, if you're doing um, stem cuttings, uh, what you're going to do is you're just going to go in and clip off part of a stem. You're, you want a good couple of, you're going to want some leaves on it and then you're going to want part of that stem to actually have a couple of nodes where there used to be leaves. You're going to let that callus off, you know, clip and prune off right above a set of leaves um, for a nice clean cut. Let it callus off for a few days and then put it into an appropriate potting mix and then they'll root off really easily for you. Now with string of buttons, um, this is kind of interesting. So the picture on the left um, is regrowth. The picture on the bottom where it says April 30th, um, I was walking by my string of buttons one day and I touched it and somehow I managed to knock the top part of it off. And so I took that top part and rooted it. So you can do kind of like a stem root cutting. Um, and so 
April 30th, you can see it's in the same size pot. You can see the growth it's put on between April 30th and June 1st. So you can do those, those tops. Um, you can also do leaf segments. So what you can do is each individual set of leaves, you can see how segmented they are. We'll start a whole nother plant for you. So they are easy to propagate um, just through different cuttings. And, I, and again, this is a string of buttons. Some string of buttons are a little bit more variegated. Um, I've come across one called Ivory Tower. That's green, whitish, and pink. And it's got some really cool colors on it. And so you get some variety there. But very easy and not a lot of care needed. Now we get into Kalonkawis, and Kalonkawis, this is a lot of times what we see at grocery stores, florist shops, um, are these kind of leathery leaves with flowers on them. And this is a very, very common type of Kalonkawi. But what's really neat about this genus is there's a lot more than just that. And so this is an example of different kinds of Kalonkawis. The one on the left that is on my I need list is called a paddle plant. Um, quite large leaves, gorgeous red color. The middle plant is Mother of Thousands. If anybody has ever watched Star Wars, I also call it Mother or Star Wars, uh, Star Trek. I call it Mother of Tribbles um, because of how many it does produce. Mother of Thousands is quite accurate. Um, on the right, we have Panda Plant, and it has very fuzzy tomatose leaves. And so you can see that they're all foliage based, but there's a huge variety in regards to um, their appearances. And so Kalonkawi, you can usually do stem or leaf cuttings. Um, some Kalonkawis, like Mother of Thousands, as you can see on the right, um, they actually produce little plantlets on the edges of their leaves. And what happens is those plantlets are attached. They form little roots, and you'll knock them, and they'll just drop down into the soil, and they'll root, and they'll start growing. And they produce very readily um, in regards to how many. And so once you remove all those plantlets off that Mother of Thousands leaf, they will immediately start to form new babies. So I can promise you, you will never run out and you will be giving them away. Um, but you can see in the bottom picture uh, is just a bunch of little baby, uh, mother of thousands that I've put on top of the soil. All I did was they very easily come off the leaf. You just set them on top of the soil and they'll root down and you don't have to really do anything. And those are ones I, I do actually use the spray bottle on while they're small. And eventually I'll transplant them up out of that flat into larger pots. Two inch pots are a good way to start um, with smaller pots if you're just looking to get kind of basic started until they get enough growth on them. Um, the picture on the top left or the top um, on the left is a leaf off of the panda plant. And that's the greatest thing about succulents is leaves will fall off and the next thing you know they're starting to root and form new uh, a new plantlet and you can kind of see there's that towards the base of the leaf there's kind of that lightish green growth that's a new plant forming off that base of that leaf and that leaf will eventually wither away and then you'll have a new panda plant. This is Pacophytum pacavaria. Um, pacavarias are actually a cross between Pacophytums and Echeverias, so they have a little bit of features of both. Um, the picture on the left is the Pacophytum. The two pictures on the right are the Pacavaria, um, and you can see it's kind of gotten elongated and stretched out, um, but you can see how compact they can be. And so these guys, um, the easy, you're going to want to do leaf cuttings on these guys only. Um, I have not been able to find any references um, in regards to their suitability for stem cuttings. But you can also see in regards to that that they kept their color really well and did not revert out like the Senecio that I showed you earlier. Now sedums, tender sedums, um, these are great. Um, this is where you get the donkey's tail. It's the one that's kind of the bluish one and you know, it's always kind of hanging down and drooping. So this is where uh, those guys fall in. Nice thing with sedums, you can do um, stem cuttings, you can do leaf cuttings. Again, you want to let them callus out. Um, and there's a great amount of variety when you start looking into even the, those tender sedum ranges in regards to color and shape and sizes. So um, they're definitely a fun one to start researching into, and they're very easy to grow, um, even with my poor lighting I had, um, the ones I've had didn't stretch out too terribly. They could have been a lot worse, but they actually stay pretty compact. So we're going to get into a couple now, and these, the ones we're going to talk about now are ones that um, I actually don't personally have in my own collection. Um, 
But this first one is the Aeoniums, and these are really cool plants. They look a little bit like Echeverias, but they're definitely different. One thing to be noted about Aeoniums, though, is they're very sensitive to damage. They have a – so shipment can be a problem. Um, people have talked about how easy it is to cause damage to leaves just by handling or touching them. They'll cause brown spots. So you got to be a little bit more gentle with Aeoniums. One of the differences with them is you can't propagate them via leaf cuttings. Leaf cuttings will only rot. They don't, they don't work, um, which makes sense when you think about how, you know, susceptible to damage those leaves are. So with Aeoniums, um, the only way to get a new aeonium is um, propagation of offsets. So if it puts off offsets or side shoots, removing those and getting those started. Or you can use a method. You can go in there and you can remove that top rosette um, and then let that callus over root out. And then you can start a new plant that way. But yeah, these guys are a little bit finicky when it comes to shipping. And some of these plants, they're, you know, it might be hard to find locally. There are various sources um, out there for places you can purchase a lot of these. And you can also find a lot of information. People are really loving succulents right now. Um, cotyledons. So you can see there's definitely different diversity here. Um, the one on the right is a bear's paw. Um, and this kind of looks a lot like panda plant, but it is a, a totally different genus. Um, from the sources that I've read, most people say that stem cuttings root easier and are more successful than leaf cuttings. So you want to make sure that um, you're kind of seeing where it is. And of course, if you're going to do any kind of stem cuttings on plants, you want to kind of make sure that, okay, either I'm going to do it because it's elongated out and it kind of needs to be rejuvenated because you don't want to start taking cuttings off of, uh, you know, young, small plants until they're a little bit further established if you want parts of them to survive as well after you've taken a part off of them. Grapedopetalum, um, this is part of the parent plant for Grapedocetum. Um, this is the other half of it. And you can see a lot of some similar features. Um, these are very thick. Most of your Grapedopetalums have this kind of purplish hue to them. And they're really wonderful because you can propagate them. They'll do offset side shoots on you. You can take leaf cuttings. You can do rosette cuttings. So this one is really kind of neat. Um, you'll also sometimes see some Grapedopetalums. They'll call them ghost plant. Um, so there's a, a lot of different common name terms out there for them, but they're really easy to propagate, and it's definitely on my need-to-have list. I just haven't gotten there yet. This is Portulacaria, um, also known as elephant bush, um, and so it's, you know, warm, warm plant, um, but this one is uh, a stem cutting only, can get quite big, very different looking type of succulent compared to some of our other ones. Um, you'll see, you can see that nice red stem on some of the newer growth and offsets, but this one you're going to just take cuttings, again, the same way um, as you would do a jade stem cutting. You're going to remove part of it, make sure there's a good cluster of leaves that are going to be left on there, remove some of the lower leaves to expose basically nodes, let it callus, and then go ahead and pot it up. So that first slide I showed you was Senecio. And Senecio is a highly diverse genus of plants. You have everything from string of pearls to blue chalk fingers. Um, the picture, the second picture in from the left um, is called pickle plant or cucumber plant um, because that base stem looks kind of like a pickle or a cucumber to kind of a vining um, type Senecio. So you can see that this has a huge diversity when it comes to um, plant options. And so um, these are going to be propagated via stem cuttings. I um, actually, the one that got super elongated and paled out, the picture on the bottom right, I'm in the process of seeing how effective leaf cuttings are. I've seen some people that have had success with it, so we're, we're going to see how well this goes. Um, String of pearls is very easy to propagate via stem cuttings um, and we'll, you know, again, let it callus and then pot it up. Um, one of the recommendations with Senecios is if it's a green foliage plant, it can tolerate lower light conditions. But if it's a blue foliage, 
um, like the blue chalk fingers, you're going to want brighter light for it so it doesn't stretch and lose that color. Because a lot of times um, what happens with succulents is they'll lose color when they're not getting adequate light, but we also see them gain color when um, light increases or actually if they're under a bit of stress. So if you go a little bit longer in between watering, sometimes it causes a little bit of stress and some succulents will actually take on a different tone or a different color along the edge or in parts of their leaves. So there's a there's some differences there. But yeah, Senecio is a really neat uh, cluster of succulents um, where you can get some really interesting plants. So um, 1245, um, real quick, so the tray on the left, this is my uh, rooting tray, and you can see all of the leaves and parts from all the different plants. Um, what you're kind of having a hard time seeing is that front half of the flat, which where it looks empty. To give you a concept of how prolific Mother of Thousands are, there are over 50 little baby Mother of Thousand plants sitting in the front half of that flat. So that's just from a very small plant. So you can imagine. There's also um, another Kalankawi species out there called Mother of Millions. Um, and it's different, but it produces just as rapidly um, as Mother of Thousands, it's just a different variety of Kalankawi. Um, and the picture on the right are just uh, the variety of my echeverias that have started rooting and forming new little plantlets. You can actually see in the picture on the right, in the right side of it, you can see the one leaf where it's got two little babies coming off the leaf, and you can see how they're a little bit stretched because they just weren't getting adequate lighting when they were starting to go. So with that, um, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute your mic or type any questions into the chat box that you might have. I'm glad it was useful. Um, and, and the final slide in the handout you received is my contact information. So of course, if you're having any problems or issues or have questions, please feel free to you know email or give me a phone call and I'm more than happy to help. Well, okay, so the question is, um, why do you want to let that node harden off or you want those leaves to callus off? What happens is when you let those leaves callus off for a few days, it creates a barrier so that you don't get too much moisture going into that cutting and it prevents it from rotting out. So if um, the question is, is there any hope for an older jade that got a fungus infection and dropped most of its leaves? So if you get into situations of, of fungus issues or rot issues, your best bet is to take a cutting of healthy plant material um, and start over. Um, because anything that's rotted isn't going to come back. Um, if it's a fungal issue, you also, when you're also taking leaf cuttings or stem cuttings or any parts of propagation, you want to make sure that tissue is healthy and undamaged. But yeah, so if there is an older jade and you still have part of it that is still healthy, you know, if the rest of it's having issues, um, maybe, you know, just taking a cutting and starting over um, with a new plant. I've actually got way too many multiple sources for um, new plants <laughs> um, that I've, I've ordered from. Um, there's various sources online. Um, I've found a cluster of my succulents I actually got at big box stores. Um, so uh, it's just, if you start searching for succulents, um, there's a, just quite a few people. Even Etsy is starting to do, get into um, selling a lot plants, you know, you go into Etsy, you start searching, you'll find different sellers um, on Etsy that are selling succulents and various house plants and things like that. Um, oh, I'm, I'm glad you uh, enjoyed the webinar. Um, yeah, succulents, again, usually with succulents, the number one thing that a lot of people struggle with is they love them so much, they overwater them. Um, because 
with house plants and uh, everything with watering, what happens is as those plants get older, depending on how old the potting mix is, depending on how big the plant is, what the temperature is, what the humidity is, really will cause variations in how often you water. So that's why I like having those containers with holes in the bottom and you can see if that soils, if it's dry all the way down to the bottom, go ahead and water it. If you get to the bottom of that pot and you feel it and it's still wet, let it go. Yeah, and then once you get, yeah, Annette, <laughs> it brought some through us yeah, and uh, his party favors and ended up keeping several. And yeah, so you, that happens and then you start propagating them and you can see how much of a rabbit hole this becomes very quickly. Um, one of the things I try to do too when I'm doing propagation and I kind of failed on the, the flat on the left, um, but I try to keep things labeled so I know what varieties they are because people are always like, oh, that's really cool. What is that one? So I just try to keep things labeled as much as possible. Um, on the bottom of those saucers, I've actually, I used a Sharpie marker and I wrote the name of the variety on the bottom of it so I would remember. So on this slide um, is my contact information. Um, there's my email, my phone number. Um, this, the recording from today's webinar will be uploaded to our University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel, and you can just visit it by going go.illinois.edu backslash IL Extension Horticulture videos, or you can just search for us on YouTube, University of Illinois Extension Horticulture. Um, this is actually also where we house all of our four season garden uh, recordings as well, um, and all the recordings from those uh, webinars are from 2014 till now. Um, we are actually open registration for our summer series of uh, four seasons garden webinars, and you can find those on the website, uh, extension website as well. And so um, if you have any other questions, you know, please feel free to unmute your mic. I'll stay on for a few more minutes um, or type it into the chat box. And I'm just really glad that you were able to join us today.